Welcome again to Thursdays with Troy. As always, I'm Troy, Troy Lambert, mystery author, editor, super plotter, and your host. And today I'm excited to talk to you all um, about Save the Cat, one of the most popular uh, novel outlining, screenplay outlining templates there is out there and plot methods there is out there. Um, so this week, instead of doing like we usually do and having a guest, I'm actually just going to be talking to you myself, similar to um, when I talked to you about the sluice journey. And we're going to walk through what Save the Cat looks like. Now, I've created a few different templates. I put one up against a book that I'm working with someone else on so we can see exactly how that works. And we're going to dive right in and go into a plotter file that shows you about Save the Cat. Now, first of all, I'm, I want to give you a little bit of background in that Save the Cat was originally more geared towards screenwriting. It was developed by Blake Schneider. Um, and then since, it's been adapted by Jessica Brody to Save the Cat Writes a Novel, which is a really fantastic resource. Now, what I want to encourage you to do, so Plotter has some starter templates, but we also have things where people have their own ideas and their own copyright of those ideas, right? And so I want to encourage you, first of all, to go and look at her book and the resources she has online. She also has some great courses that will help you walk through the process, through what I'm going to cover in a very quick process, of how to use Save the Cat to basically write a novel. Now, I'm going to give you a high-level overview of how I have set it up in Plotter in three unique different ways. I would also recommend that you go through and set it up yourself your own way because that is going to help you understand the template better, first of all, and understand the plot structure better and understand better how to use it and add your own flair to it based on your writing style, your genre, and the things that you do. So let's dig right into it. We're actually going to start with this particular um, plotter file. Now, what this is, is I've taken the basics of Save the Cat and I put it up against a um, book that I'm actually working on uh, with another writer. So this is essentially her plot, her book, um, put up against the Save the Cat template. Okay. So... What I've done at the top, you'll notice a few different lines. First of all, I've broken this up into the three acts using our current act structure. And then I have the current act structure and plotter. And then I have broken it into basically the 15 different beats. Now, don't worry, I'm going to get to the more complex 40 uh, scene template that you can make out of the 15 scene Save the Cat, but we're just gonna start with this one right here. So we're gonna start with that. At the top, I put a timeline for percentages. You can use this or not use this. I like this because I like to see if I'm aiming for a 70,000 word novel, let's say, that I can tell exactly about what my word count should be on each of these things. Um, so the reason I stick with the percentage is you may be writing an epic fantasy that's going to be 180,000 words long. So your word count for each of these sections is going to be different. But that's some simple math that even a writer can do. You take a percentage of your overall total and you break that down. Um, this is especially helpful in revision. If you're revising a novel that you already have and you know what the word count is, then breaking it into these percentages and making sure you're hitting these targets for save the cat correctly are a really good it's a really good way to do things okay so we're going to go through and i'm going to talk briefly i'm not going to go too in depth into the actual plot that i have under here i am going to show you that this is how i do things is i have a main plot template and a subplot template and then i put mine underneath it the reason I do that is I may want to refer back to what the template actually says in the process of plotting now, once I'm done plotting, and I'll show you that file in a little while, then I actually delete the templates, the main plot template and the subplot template. And I, when I export to Scrivener, I only export what I have created. I take out those instructions since I no longer need them. So that's the way I start. So in this particular case, 
basically with a save the cat, what you're going to do is you're going to start with an opening image. And this is the hook that draws the reader into the rest of your book. It's the first beat of act one. Um, it serves as kind of the before snapshot. We're showing your main character's uh, life as it is now. This is very similar to the hero's journey where you basically start up with life as normal. So the opening image is generally fairly short um, because you want to get into your story right away. So this we say zero to 1% um, as far as the percentage. But what that means is you're essentially setting the scene for what your uh, hero's normal life is like. And then you kind of state the theme of your story. So the statements made by a character, not the hero usually, that hints at what the story arc is going to be. What's this hero going to have to learn or discover before the end of the book? This is the life lesson. This is what's coming. Okay. And this is also in that initial scene before you really drop into uh, the action part of things. And then you're going to set things up. And this is your first 10%. Now, it's not that you can't have action in these scenes, but this is not yet the inciting incident. You're still looking at what the hero looks, hero's life looks like before the transformation, including how their life is flawed in some way. And that usually ties to that life lesson that we're stating in the theme. You also are going to introduce other supporting characters generally that are important, that are, that are going to join the, join the hero on their journey as a part of their primary goal. Okay. But the, the most important thing you want to show is the characteristic of your hero that needs to change, that they're reluctant to change. You can kind of hint at the stakes of that by showing us the world. And this works especially well in this particular case. We're looking at, at a dystopian type of novel, right? And what's basically happening is this young girl is stranded on what is one of the islands that was once one of the seven hills of San Francisco. And she's there with a tribe of people who have been stuck there, and they're basically running out of resources. But this little girl has two issues, or young lady, actually, not a little girl, has two issues. And one of them is that she is deaf. So she challenged, she's challenged to fit into normal society anyway, because she can read lips and she can sign, but she, she can't hear. She can't hear what's going on. And the second obstacle is that she's on an island surrounded by water, and she's afraid of water. So in this initial setup phase, which includes the opening image and the statement of the theme, both those things are included in this initial setup. We're going to learn about her, that she's deaf, she can't hear, and we're going to learn about those struggles just a little bit. And we're also going to learn, get a little bit of a hint at her fear of water. We're not going to get a, a big hint at that until beat four, and in some cases beyond. It just becomes what depends on where you want to put this in. Some people would argue that you don't want to introduce this until the first part of Act 2, and we'll actually talk about that in a few minutes, um, what that means and what that looks like. But so that's where we go from here, right, is we've got to do the setup, and then we have the catalyst. Now, you'll notice on these different beats that the catalyst happens right at 10%, we say. Now, this doesn't have to be an exact number. Um, don't go through your manuscript, and, and if you're familiar with Save the Cat, you know this. Don't go through your manuscript and say 70,000 words at 7,000 words, bam, word 7,002 has to be the catalyst. But it's in this general range that this is where your catalyst and what we would call your inciting incident needs to happen. So what this is about is the life-changing event that happens to the hero that kind of pushes them into whatever their journey is going to be, into a new world, into a new way of thinking. It's always an action beat, and it's always something that's fairly big. Sometimes before this, in the setup, you'll have a hook that brings people into the story, but this isn't, it's not yet the inciting incident. The inciting incident happens right here, write it about 10% into your book. And it's usually the big thing. It introduces the big thing that disrupts this person's life and that's going to throw them into this journey.
right? So this has to be big. It can't be small. It can't be something that's a minor change. It has to be something really big. And so in this case, what we have is we have a, a tragedy happening to the tribe that basically throws them into a problem, okay? And so, so the, the tribe on the island is now running out of fuel and they're running out of resources to, to um, rejuvenate that fuel and things like that. So they found themselves in this incredible dilemma. And we see that this girl is, now she's afraid, her whole tribe is threatened and she feels like she's helpless. She can't do much of anything with that. And the way I deal with that, so is that usually in these scene cards, I typically have some notes about the scene, a nearby volcanic eruption. This is part of the setup here, but in these I have attributes. And in those attributes, what I have is the goal of the character in the scene. Okay, and then I also have in there an emotion. You'll notice the emotion sometimes in, in different things I've called this the verb or something like that. What it is, is it's what I want the reader to feel when they get done with this scene. I want them to be curious. I want them to be concerned, just like Spreta, our main character, is going to be. And I'm kind of, here I'm kind of introducing the start of the main conflict. There's an idea of climate change and scarcity here in this dystopian novel. And I'm introducing that concept here. I'm not telling you a lot about it, but I'm, I'm having a volcano erupt that tells you, hey, there's something wrong. And it introduces you to what's happening in this world right now, right? So I have attributes in the scenes. I have a description in the scenes that all help me set those things up and make sure that I'm on track when I get to things like the debate. So usually this is where several scenes happen or chapters, depending upon the length of your book, where basically our hero reacts to what happened in the catalyst. So this is a sequence. This includes that catalyst, but it's also a 10 to 20% mark that takes us forward in the story and gets the, our character asking questions about what they should do, what's going to happen next all those different things, right? So in, in this case, Sprita basically has these ideas, but she's a young deaf girl. How can she get the adults and things to listen to her? And so there's several different scenes that go through this, right? And this is where breaking things out into even more scenes and even more detail than we have here is one of the things that people like to do, okay? With the save the cat template. Okay, so as we roll forward, we get into the break into two, where this is where the hero decides to accept. This is sometimes called uh, the call to action. This is when they decide to accept the call to action. In the hero's journey before this, they would have refused the call to action, maybe in part of that beat five, in part of that area there. This is the exact moment when the, the hero decides to leave their country, comfort zone, try something new, venture into a new world. So they've decided, okay, I don't have any choice. This journey is now in front of me. Okay. This is also often where we introduce the B story. Now we've already introduced the B story briefly, which is that our heroine is afraid of water and she's on an island that's surrounded by water. So, but this also introduces one of the main characters that we've been introduced to so far. It solidifies her and that main character's relationship on the journey. So we've introduced now a helper character that's going to be in effect her partner. Now notice that one of the things that we're gonna look at here shortly once we're done with our big overview is that beats are not chapters and chapters are not scenes. Those things are all different. So when we start to unpack this a little bit more, understand this is at the 20% mark, but we see that beat seven, this is a long beat. This is from 20 to 50%. This is where a large percentage of the story happens. And this is the fun and games part of the story, or what is often called the promise of the premise. Okay. And so this is when it's a long sequence of multiple scenes or chapters where we see them in their new world. So the act two is generally the longest part of a book. 
And this is where they're either in, in a romance, this would be the part where they're loving it and things are going well, or in more of a tragedy, this is where they're hating the way things are going and they're floundering. Okay, so you can use this template for a variety of genres, and we'll talk about that in a few in a few minutes too. But it's not limited to one genre. We're obviously using it for dystopian. It's very popular for using for um, thrillers, for romance, for all kinds of different stories because it's very flexible and adaptable, and you can go as deep or as narrow as you want. So in these particular cases, normally I would have maybe a sentence or two that describes each scene that happens in this part. Now this author that I'm working with obviously give, goes into a little bit deeper discussion across several different scenes of exactly what this section is going to look like, right? I would maybe have a few sentences here at the top paragraph. This one has a lot more in depth about what Sprit is going to do, how she decides her idea is going to work and how she's going to make that happen. So there's a whole series of events that's included in this that's a huge beat and a huge section. So you notice that we talk about the break into two, that's more of a precise moment. And then we go into the fun of games, which follows that precise moment and is a much broader, longer beat. Okay, so then when we hit the midpoint, the midpoint is exactly what it sounds like, is the middle. Um, again, don't get caught up on word counts this being, you know, 72,000 word novel, it's got to be at 36,000 words. No, it, it doesn't really matter if you're close to the middle of your book. Now, if you're way off on either side, your pacing, the pacing of your story might suffer a little bit. And when, when we talk about pacing of the story, we're really talking about reader expectations and what they've come to expect from the shape of stories. And a reader won't know, oh, this author missed the midpoint. They'll just say something feels wrong here. Okay, the, the reader doesn't know all these writerly terms that we're putting behind the scenes and they're not gonna see, well, she really missed beat seven and saved the cat. They're just gonna say something feels wrong about the timing of what happens in this story. Okay, so that's why it's really important for you to know these things. But this is literally in the middle of the, pot, the novel. The fun of games culminates in either like a false victory, usually a try fail in a mystery. This will be the uh, detective thinks they've caught the bad guy, but oh darn, it was the wrong person. This often happens in the first 20 minutes of Law and Order. Thank you, NBC. But um, or in some cases, it can be a false defeat. In a romance, it can be a false defeat where it feels like things are going bad. It feels like, oh no, we're gonna break up. Things aren't gonna work out. But then something else happens um, that actually raises the stakes, pushes the hero forward and pushes them kind of in the opposite direction of their try-fail. You know, plot twist, time clock. This is where the, talks, the clock starts ticking. Um, this is the ramp up of the love story. Things get more serious, different things like that. So there's all kinds of popular choices for what the midpoint is actually gonna look like. But and depending upon your genre, and if you look at your genre, uh, if you search online for Save the Cat in your genre, you're going to find all kinds of advice about exactly what needs to happen at the midpoint, okay? So it, it depends on really on your story, but this is a precise point. And then we have the next section where the bad guys close in. If the midpoint's a fault victory, this section is a downward path where things get progressively worse. If you're talking about a thriller or a detective thing or things like that is where this is a downward path where the detective has gone, now I screwed up and he's lost all hope and he, he all none of the clues are working out. Um, that type of thing. If it's a false defeat, it's the opposite. A lot of times with a romance, this is the upward path where the couple seems to be getting better. They seem to be getting together, that type of thing. But essentially what we need to see here is that either the hero's flaws, like in the case of a romance, um, the fact that this guy has reservations about commitment or things like that is a deep-rooted flaw. And that starts to creep in, even if we're seeing kind of a happiness trend, that starts to creep in, okay? Um, either that or like in the detective's case, maybe he's just got a blind spot and he's missing something. And we can see that's something he's going to be able to pull out eventually, but 
you know, it's he, he's just messed it up a little bit, that type of thing, okay? And usually the your hero gets a newer modified goal through this beat. They kind of figure out, okay, that all went wrong. Things started going bad. Maybe I need to look at this in a different light, okay? And that light, so that's often talked about in the hero's journey as well um, in other different plot formats, okay? But then we get to beat 10. Now, this is another precise moment. This is generally about 75% through the novel. And this is just the lowest point in the novel. It's where the hero just loses, loses it all. And he's at rock bottom. Um, maybe, he, maybe he passes out at the end of this chapter and we don't know if he's alive or not. Something like that. Or something dies. Uh, again, metaphorically, it can be love, it can be, you know, whatever those different things are. Um, but something really, really bad happens that just kind of disrupts everything. And it appears that there just isn't any hope. And right after that, we have this short little beat, which is a much shorter beat, where the character is hit rock bottom. They kind of wallow in their hopelessness, you know. Uh, mourning the loss of whatever's gone, they're just done, whatever. So they they basically, this is the moment where they fall completely and they contemplate that fall and what has caused that and what is happening. And then they decide how or if they're going to move forward, right? And usually this is where this tiny little bit of hope that came before that section, that's where that comes in is that suddenly that new direction kind of materializes. And at 80%, we have the break into three. This is the aha moment. So that moment, that glimmer of hope that they had, like maybe this is a different direction. Maybe this is the way I should go. This is when that becomes realized. So it basically fixes the problem and becomes a new, this becomes a new, more hopeful story uh, in general terms, you know, the couple uh, that was torn apart by their parents decides that their love matters more than what their in-laws think of them, and they get together anyway, or those that type of a thing. Or the detective finally realizes that clue that he saw back in chapter three actually means something completely different than he thought, and this is the answer. So the finale is that 80% to 99% where basically the hero acts on that new hope, that new direction, and that way that things he thinks things should go. But it, you have to prove it at that point. So essentially, even though the detective knows the clue when he breaks into three that he needs to pursue, he has to pursue and prove it. The love of the couple has to prove themselves, right? They enact the plan they come up with. He asks her to marry him, all those different types of things or whatever the whatever the case may be. So, But whatever reluctance the guy had for commitment is now destroyed or the bad guy is suddenly in a bad position uh, in a mystery. This is often a chase scene, right? You see the detective and he's running after the guy and the bad guy is sprinting away from him and he knows he's going to catch him. The bad guy knows that the detective is on his tail. And so there, there's a moment of tension there. But we have at this point, we have that hope that the, that the hero is going to win. And at the end of this finale, essentially, the hero does win. The hero comes out triumphant right? Good things, the good things they were hoping for happen, right? Now, then we see the final image. This is the last 1% of the book. This is basically where we see that it's the opposite of the open, opening image. In this case, what we have is we have Spritta, our heroine, has now she has saved the day, so to speak. She's basically gotten the power back up, She's gotten things back online, but more importantly, she's being seen and heard by the adults in the situation and she's being acknowledged, right? And so we have this kind of, you know, final victory that things are actually going to be okay. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, in this particular book, we have an epilogue, which sets us up for the next 
book is actually not really an epilogue. It's more of a final chapter where we get a kind of a, that downward um, ending of the book where we see these things that are coming in the next book. And we also see the full resolution of everything that happened. So even that, though that final image gave us victory, we see that victory explored just a little more in the next um, thing. And so I called this 102% because it's, it's really, it's beyond the end of the story, but it's enhancing the end of the story by adding a little bit extra to it. But that's just for this particular book. Often you can end a book on that final image with that final 100%. And that's the image you leave the reader with. Even if you've got a, a, a sequel coming, you can just hint at what's coming in that next one. Now, the thing we didn't talk about is usually there is a B story, a subplot. Um, and this one is more just related to the this young girl's fear of water and her friendship with a friend. And here we see that She's over her fear of water, at least partly. She's now actually being heard. Her friend is, you know, they become best friends and they'll head off in their next adventure together. Okay. So this is, this is the overall view of the Save the Cat. This is the typical 15 beat thing that you see. If you look up Save the Cat, you will see that this is, this is the thing that you generally see first. This is one of the ways to set it up in Plotter. You know, so I've got the percentage up top. I've got the acts, okay? I've got the act one, act two, act three, um, very simply separated out. And then, um, and obviously act three is the shortest one. It always is. And so you look at that, the beginning, the middle, act two, and then we just look at the end at the final act and the final image. Okay, that's one way to do this in Plotter. However, I know that people are going to ask, so I prepared for it. Oh, and I'm gonna show you one other thing before I move on to that. So, I'm actually going to share a different screen. In this particular case, I'm gonna show you what, a, what this looks like when I delete things and get it ready for export. So in this case, what has happened is the writer that I'm working with, instead of having all the scenes in one card like that, like I had them, has separated them out into different scenes, scene one, scene two, scene three, and the various different scenes that go under the different parts. And instead of having, instead of having a separate timeline for the template, there's a little bit of an instruction at the template here that then is followed with a little bit of explanation of what this particular chapter or what this particular scene is about. And then this just goes through the standard 15 scenes and comes down to the end, right? And so this, this would be the clean copy that then this writer would export to Scrivener, right? To start writing their thing because it has all the different scenes that they wanna write in here. Um, and this is the way they've arranged it. However, because of who I am as more of an architect, I tend to take this one step further. Now, many of you will know that when you take Blake Snyder's 15 uh, beats, a lot of people get confused because a beat is not a scene. A scene is not a beat, a beat is not a scene. So, um, that, so basically, you wanna separate those beats out even further into smaller scenes. Now, there's a couple ways that you can do that with Plotter, okay? There's a, there's a couple ways you can make that happen. Now, and I'm going to show you both of them um, as I have created them. Now, you can create them in other ways as well, but this is what I call uh, the Save the Cat 15 to 40, okay? And so what that looks like initially is going to be like this, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna look at it from a high level view, um, first of all, uh, because I want you to see the overall view of what this looks like. So what we've done is essentially, we've taken those, the opening image, the theme stated and the catalyst and put them up here in act one. And then we've broken apart the setup 
and the debate into these percentages and how many scenes we think should go in there. So for instance, the main plot, uh, this is the setup, scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four. And then in this section, you notice that there's more scenes in that 10 to 20% section. We're gonna have about four scenes, give or take on average. In this big break into two section, we're going to have a whole bunch of scenes. You can see as I scroll down, we're gonna go from scene nine all the way to scene 20 in this 20 to 50% section. And this way you can write all of those scenes in the sequence that they should be in, or you can, when you export, you'll have a place for each of those scenes for you to write. Same thing in the midpoint. We're gonna have a number of scenes that are gonna be included in the midpoint as well. We're gonna go up to about scene 28 at that point. Uh, the Dark Knight of the Soul is gonna add a couple more scenes, break into three with one scene in scene 31 where we have that exact moment at 80%. And then the final image and the finale is 81 to 100%. And we have all of those scenes lined out like this. Now, of course, what you can do is you can collapse this as you go along. So you can see that I've got a whole bunch of scenes under here, but that way I can see what my percentages are. Again, I put my percentages at the top. You don't necessarily have to do this. This is just my method for doing it. Uh, you notice that also I have put the B story at the beginning of Act 2A. A lot of people feel like that's where you should start it is right at the beginning of Act 2. Um, some people will argue that you should start it earlier in Act 1. Um, for the sake of this particular, just looking at this particular template, this is the way I did this. Now, but I will say that this is not necessarily the most efficient way to do this with Plotter. This is the way of doing it with stacking scenes. But because we have a structure available to us, there's actually another way. So this is if you want to keep this top part of your timeline compact and you don't mind the rest of it running down this way a little bit more. And of course, when you look at that in this larger format, you have plenty of room to write your various scenes and to maneuver around this. But it basically just makes this the top part of it very compact, right? Very easy to look at. And then you can collapse or not uncollapse it as you will. But there is a better way, and this is the second method that I use. And this one is essentially, you'll see, let me back out so you can look at this one overall as well. Instead of, we're using our act structure as plotter, so we're using our act structure, we're using our opening image, and we've got the setup, scene one, and scene two. Then the theme stated, scene three and four. So we know that all of those go in that chunk of an area. Then we have the catalyst or inciting incident, we have scene five, six, seven, and eight that all fall under this debate section of the template. And so we don't have the explanation of each of these things the way we would if we had it on a different timeline and we could put a different spot for that explanation. But we also, at this point, we've added the percentages here of what each part should look like, right? So this one would actually be, um, right at one to five percent and then we would go from there right we would have our um five to ten percent here and then right at our uh, catalyst we would have our ten percent and etc we would have our 10 to 20 here and that would put us right on track okay so this then this gives us the percentages approximately where we need to be as we go. In other words, don't, as, as stated before, don't get hung up on being exact. And then the way I would do this one is my scenes would go here on the main plot. My B story would start down here and my B story scenes would go on the B story uh, template here um, on, on the B story timeline here. So this is a way to do it. Um, it's not, again, it's not the only way there's, but if you wanna be detailed and see all 40 of the different scenes that you should have. So again, we have the opening image, the setup couple of scenes, you know, as we move to the middle of this one, 
We've got all these scenes all down to number 20. We've got the midpoint, and we know we've got scenes 21 through 28. And again, these numbers don't have to be exact. And then we go into Act 2B, which is basically just the dark night of the soul. And we have a couple different scenes that are at the end of Act 2 that drive us right into Act 3. Um, and then Act 3, we finish things off with uh, the one scene that breaks into Act 3, the scenes of the finale, and then the scenes that come down to the final image. And then, of course, we've added this extra scene here uh, just as your, your aftermath and your ability to wrap things up from there. Okay, so this is just one of the one of the methods for doing this. And then, of course, you can collapse these up here. So if you're done with Act 1, as you break into 2, you can collapse up that Act 1 so you don't have to look at all of it. It's all still in there, but you don't have to look at all of it. You can just look at Act 2, Act 2A. And then when you're done with that, you can collapse that as well. And then if you need to look at the whole thing, you can expand it out again, okay? And this is, so this is, we could have pulled the other uh, parts of that book uh, that we were working on onto this timeline and done the exact same thing that we did um, with it in the other ones, only just put the scenes differently. We would have just put our scenes down on this uh, section here. So this would be my scene two. And then, if, again, if we look at this in a more uh, traditional way, you're all the way down here where you can really look at your, uh, where I can see my typo there. And um, we can really look in depth at your scenes. Okay. So to review, uh, three different methods. Uh, this is using the act structure and the uh, beat structure and then the scene structure to make this all into one gigantic uh, long uh, plot thing that we can then add our things to in these various different things, uh, different spaces along the timeline, the main plot and your B story. And then we can expand those out as you go. Or the alternative is that you can keep it compact at the top and make it go long at the bottom and include all your, all your different scenes there um, in the various different, so you can still break this out out into those 40 different scenes that you need to have for the overall book. And then uh, we have the original method that we used. Now, do also understand that the, the scenes are not chapters. So a chapter can have more than one scene. Or in the case of some uh, longer form, uh, urban fantasy, things like that, a scene can be an entire chapter. That can take up an entire chapter. Uh, to do a scene. And so you can adapt this in whatever way you want. In fact, you could break these into various different groups, depending upon how you um, want to make this template work for you and how it works best for your style and for your genre of fiction. So this is just, this is just, it's just a couple different ways to look at the Save the Cat. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, close out the broadcast by saying, hey, thanks, guys, for joining in. I hope that you learned a lot by going through this um, methods, these methods of using Save the Cat. Uh, there are tons of other methods out there. There are tons of different ways to set up these templates. These are just a few of them. So thanks very much for your attention. And um, do let me know uh, in the comments, as always, if you have any questions. So thanks for joining us with Thursdays with Troy.